This month on In the Life, looking back on our first 13 years. Real live gay on the inside. No one ever done a gay and lesbian show before, so we were all starting from scratch. A sister for our community. The church is the people of God. The church isn't merely church leaders. And food for thought. I knew her as the, the straight married girl, you know. All this and more on America's gay and lesbian news magazine, In the Life. In the Life is funded in part by the H. Van Ameringen Foundation. Additional support provided by the Ford Foundation, the Gill Foundation, and the annual support of In the Life members like you. Welcome to In the Life. I'm Kate Clinton. You're not. Thirteen years ago, a small group of people had a big idea to create the first gay and lesbian TV show. I had the pleasure of hosting that debut program. Teleprompters had not been invented by then. I made up a great deal of the material. I had bigger hair, larger shoulder pads. It was a different time. But tonight, I'm excited to be here again as a blonde. But before we move forward, let's look back at the people and places that made us in the life. When I heard about homosexuals, for example, in the news, it was probably because of a sting operation in um, a park men's room. So everything that had to deal with sexual orientation in my mind when I was a young adult was either very negative, um, criminal, or a stereotype that was laughed at. I, I myself couldn't imagine seeing um, gay images, especially real gay people, you know, real live gay on the inside, you know, that we weren't just fictional characters. The general atmosphere during the Reagan and, and Bush era was, was one of absolute um, disregard of the gay community. Um, criminal disregard in regards to AIDS. People were dying and they didn't care. So what makes you think that you're ever going to have a show on TV about these people? I think I'm about to kiss you. I think I'm about to be kissed. Gay sex is so hot. <laughs> there was no Will and Grace. There was no Ellen show. There was no queer as folk. There was no the L word. Come on, help me out here. You know I mean it. There was nothing, absolutely nothing, on television. Will you please raise your right but the political hand landscape hand was hand changing. Hand Bill Clinton's hand inauguration hand signaled hand a new era of hope and opportunity. I, William Jefferson. Clinton. It was an incredible time for the gay community because Clinton had just been elected, and there was such a sense of, of hope in the community. The Reagan-Bush era was over, and we had somebody who could say the word gay without throwing up, and that we, for, for once, were going to have a chance to have our, voice, our voices heard and our, and our images seen. I would talk to gay people, and they would tell me what they were doing, and it all sounded very exciting. And I said, you know, this should be recorded. This should be you know, nationally shown somewhere so that people can see all this action. Fueled by that energy, John Scagliotti, a documentary filmmaker, initiated a novel idea to launch a gay and lesbian TV show. The time was ripe. I was looking at an issue of Outweek, a magazine that doesn't exist anymore, and I remember a thin column on the side. There might have even been a picture at the top or a big heading about um, public television or radio producer John Scagliotti um, plans to create series on gay life. When I read that, I thought, wow. I saw an ad. I, I picked up my first backstage ever. I was waitressing, studied acting, saw an ad for a gay and lesbian uh, news magazine. 
Why? I sent him a picture of myself waitressing when I didn't have an 8x10. Catherine Linton. New and exciting changes are going on in our community. They called me and in and did the audition and called here. the show in the lice. Remember, if you're in the lice, in you, if you're in the lice, if you're in the life, <laughs> hope you don't have life, lice. And somehow landed the job. Should I leave out the lice part? <laughs> No one ever done a gay and lesbian show before, so we were all starting from scratch. There was no template. So as we were making up, as, as we were going along, it really had the feel of um, that old movie Babes in Arms with Judy Garland and Mickey Rooney, where you know they're on, I think they're like in a farm and rural environment, but they want to put on this show. So they just get all their, their friends together and somehow put on this great show in the, the barn. And it real, in the life in those early years really had that feel of, let's go ahead and put on a show. <laughs> you trade away my offspring, but my culture still survive. You steal our land and rob our natural resource. With genocide and damnation, you discard us with no cause. No. John's idea was to combine the, um, the talk show host format, like um, say an Oprah or a Phil Donahue, with the old um, 1960 series, The Ed Sullivan Show, which was a performance-based show. Thank you very much. Thank you. What a way to come out. When Kate Clinton, our host, came out for the first time, we had to rehearse it a few times, even with the audience. The applause that she got, it was as if, you know, we landed on the moon for the first time. <laughs> it was amazing, amazing. It seems that the broadcasting apologists are hiding behind Big Bird, Mr. Rogers, and Masterpiece Theater, laying down their quality smokescreen while they shovel out funding for gay and lesbian variety shows. On the floor of the Senate, um, then-Senator Bob Dole was denouncing funding to PBS. We had to lobby every single PBS station across the country. So we had to gain their trust and convince them that by being gay doesn't mean that we're going to be nude or that we're going to be talking about sex the whole time. We had to convince them that we could be serious and that we were okay. For, to be on their channel. I think the first thing they said was, oh, you're not gonna use bad language, are you? They just assumed that gay people used bad language. I can't tell you how many program directors said, oh, please don't use bad language. As if every gay person was walking around, you know, swearing. There was nothing that we said that was offensive. I mean, nothing. We had to, they would, we would find tooth, tooth comb our show. They would find tooth comb our show unbelievably before they ever aired it. And every month we had to lobby and make sure that they were still putting us on. Behind the scenes, it was a bare bones operation. And um, one of our staff members' desks was made out of apple crates stacked on top of each other. You had to edit at three in the morning in someone's broken down studio that was freezing. I love cats, but they had the mattiest, nastiest cat in the studio that would just walk through the studio, and, you know, mid last sentence of a take and was like, I'm gonna kill that cat. After the first year, a um, television producer from the nightly, nightly news on NBC came and said, gee, I'd love to produce something for you. And I said, oh, this is great, great, fantastic. And then he, <laughs> he said, what would be my budget? And I told him what the budget was. It's something like a thousand dollars a piece. He says, we spend more than that in an hour on messengers. <laughs> Getting on TV was only half the battle. The other half was convincing people that the gay and lesbian community had the right to be there. I had to personally call every PBS director, and if we weren't on, ask them why. And of course, their usual response was, we don't have gay people here. Um, and, you know, it was a 
constant battle. We went from six stations to 100 stations to, I mean, it was phone call after phone call. The, they did not want to have to air us. And we just had to keep reminding them, it's your mandate to represent all communities. And then they did this Pride special with Leah Delaria hosting. Leah shows up in a pink taffeta dress, you know, talking about herself as a drag queen in this convertible car and calling herself a dyke. And at one point in the, in the special, she's straddling a, a cannon, which is hysterical now. But at that time, most of the complaints came from gay people. Happy Gay Day! They were freaked out. This was gays gone wild. This was wrong. This was not, this was, this was so terrifying to people because it was like, how can you show this woman yelling, I'm a dyke, you know? My parents could watch this. There was a tremendous amount of self-censorship because nothing else was on. So when you, when you have no room in the culture and you have no I images of yourself, people were really protective over what that image was that, that eked out on this one little show, you know, the only thing out there at the time. And to put someone kind of, quote, controversial on, within the community, I think might have uh, raised a few uh, hairs on a few backs of a few necks. And we did. You know, the board members, people really responded and, and decided to go 180 degrees in the opposite direction. And then next you have, you know, um, Ken and, and drag queen Barbie, me, which was, you know, Greg Watt and myself suddenly behind, you know, a desk. I had more makeup on and jewelry than I'd ever worn in my life. We're here to bring you the personalities, performances, issues, and events that put the gay community on the front page of your local news. That's when the lights started moving towards the news magazine format that we have now. And that allowed us really to get out of the studio situation, as well as travel around the country and tell even more stories, not just in New York, but around the country and eventually all over the, the globe, really. You might expect it to be even more difficult to be an openly gay politician running for mayor in a city that's less gay friendly than San Francisco. What was really, really surprising to me is how many gay people didn't know what other gay people were doing. There was really a, a, you know, a lack of information. Gay and lesbians in the urban centers had no idea what people were doing in Ohio. Where the car is king. So we wanted the program immediately not to feel like it was a New York-centric program or a city-centric, so we wanted to get out on the street. Montana still has a law on the books that declares any same-sex sexual contact illegal. Helena, Montana was having their first uh, gay pride parade ever, and I flew to Helena, Montana to cover this pride parade for our June Pride special. And first thing that happens is that I see a bunch of yahoos with their signs, you know, steers, not queers. So I said, let's go over to these guys. So you're, you're out here because it's God's love? That's right. What are you? I suppose you're Leslie, huh? Are you? Can you truly say? I'm straight. Uh huh. That's what God put us on here. You're a woman, I'm a man. Uh -huh. That's why we're here is, is two. Right. So, so, what, what, so, so what gives you and what do you think is right about being a lesbian or being a gay? That's my question to you. Uh -huh. And one of the guys, you know, um, brilliant little cowboy that he was, figures out that I'm a lesbian and starts attacking me. What's going on right now? Nobody sticks up for our kids. And I was like, cut. Done with this interview. What you guys just get in that closet where you belong? People like you. That night, I went out to the dance, to the gay dance, and guys were driving by, throwing bottles, saying, "We are going to kill you, you effing faggots." And I was absolutely sure that they would. I couldn't believe the bravery of these people from Helena, Montana, knowing where they live, knowing that they have to go home to their ranches, knowing that they're on the nightly news. You know. Marching? Out? Proud? I mean, it was, to me, it was, it was a testament, again, to how strong our community is and how much people were willing to sacrifice um, in order to be out. Sometimes the stereotypes were surprising for us. You got to rural America, you expect homophobia, you expect the horror story, and you find a real positive story. One of the first rural stories we did was this mayor in um, Missouri. And he had been reelected 10 times. And I, you know, we went out to see him. He was there with his 
boyfriend living in this trailer uh, for, you know, 20 years before we got there. It was pretty rough because there was, everybody was very closeted about it and I thought, actually I thought I was the only one, so. I think that also has an impulse that helped gay people to come out in rural areas in a much greater way than, they, than people believed they could. The stories were fascinating. Some were brutal, some were wonderful, and, and any time you can tell those stories, it was a real opportunity and an honor to meet people all across America. By the end of the second season, we were preparing to do a show on the second March on Washington for LGBT rights. that uh, was incredible. And at first, like, a major gathering of, of people and celebrities coming out. And, you know, you had Martina and Melissa. And, you know, suddenly we, we started to have more public icons. It was about really a coming together and fighting for our civil rights for the first time and saying we are American citizens. And yes, we have public figures that, we, that are coming out and proudly coming out. For me, it was an incredible milestone to do the March on Washington episode. Um, it was one of the most exciting things I'd ever done in my life, really. David. One of the major moments was the 1996 display of the quilt. And it was, it was such an incredible thing to see spread out, you know. Peter H. The March on Washington years before, the, the entire mall was filled with bodies, you know, it was filled with people, you know, fighting, cheering. And then in 96, you know, it was covered with a quilt that showed how many of those people we had lost. Um, and, you know, you always wonder how far we would have been at that point had we not been knocked down you know, by that devastating um, plague. We take you now to Cleveland, where a young boy named Robbie Kirkland really lived. Robbie Kirkland was a high school student who knew he was gay from the time he was in, in junior high. His mother was able to piece together how much he was struggling with his own sexuality through his diary writings. Finally, had found a, a, a youth group that he could go and meet other gay teens, and the week before he was supposed to go to his first meeting, he went to the attic and shot himself. I flew to Cincinnati, where his, where his mother was, and I'm sitting in this woman's kitchen, and then she says, do you want to see Robbie's room? And I said, I said, yeah, sure, of course. And, um, and we go into his room, and she hadn't made his bed. And he had killed himself, I think, eight months before. And she couldn't make his bed, you know. He was right at the edge of getting help, but it was too late. We kept getting letter after letter, week after week, not just from kids, sometimes from parents too, family members, you know. You know, thank, thank God you're around. Um, now I can understand my gay son or daughter better. I had no idea that these are things that my kid is going through. There were so many different people who would come up and generally whisper, or in a very low voice, say, thank you for what you're doing. We had the opportunity to at least give a piece of who we are, you know, on television. Then how could you not want to do that? How could you not want to wake up every day and do that? Still to come on In the Life, a sister for us all. Well, I decided to do the film because it would give much more exposure to the work that I'm doing for lesbian and gay people. A chef story. I love shopping for food. I love looking at food. I love eating food. And a place to come out. Regarding my parents, uh, I, I, I really regret not telling them that I was gay. This is a story about Anita Lowe, a not-so-typical celebrity chef who has built her entire life around food. Five years ago, she and her partner opened up Anissa, an upscale restaurant in New York City's Greenwich Village. Let's go backstage to see their shared vision take shape.
My earliest food memory was when I was two years old and my mother was, was feeding us oranges. And I was just eating this orange and, it, and the, it was so juicy. I remember it was like dripping down my chin and like down my um, shirt and, and it was like dripping off my elbows. Okay, so you got my fabulous mustard today. I love shopping for food. I love looking at food. I love eating food. I like the physical sensation of chopping things. I love the smells. It's very sensual. Thank you. Oh, and if you want, some people do kimchi juice which I like. Oh, I always forget. I like being around kindred souls who love sweetbreads as much as I do, you know. Okay. We've got a really great crew. Yeah, take out all the bones with the, you know, the little, yeah. Yeah, you can cut off the head. You can cut off the tail as well. Not that. Um, but, you know, it's important to me that everyone on my staff, like, respect the food. It's just a beef broth. It is really, really hard to do a 13-table restaurant. I mean, most restaurant couples break up. A lot, a lot of them do. Good evening, Anissa. Yeah, where's Anita? Am we booking table two at? Um, 8.30. There's a, a clear delineation of front of the house and the back of the house. I need any four of them for Sunday. And I'm in charge of the front of the house and she's in the back. <laughs> she's great at what she does. She's using her palette. Oh, it's so good. She's clearly the more social of the two. Uh, yeah, and I think she's really good at putting people at ease. I was a cook as well. So at one point, we thought, oh, well, you know, we'll, we'll cook together. And then if you think about it, we would kill each other. <laughs> I mean, it would be terrible. I grew up in a, in, in a really multicultural family. My mother is, is Chinese Malaysian, um, and Malaysia is like the crossroads of Asia. My father, who's from Shanghai, you know, which is also, you know, a different culture. My mother remarried to my stepfather, who was waspy. You know, we had, we went to the Cape for the summer. So this is, this is, um, this is a mul naengmyeon. You take the naengmyeon in there. Uh, it's a cold Korean noodle soup, so you take... Um, I had a, a nanny who was Hungarian. My nanny would teach us how to forage. We would pick dandelion greens, and she would teach us that, that we could eat them. And yeah, we'd have them in salads, and uh, we would pick wild blackberries and, and you know, mix them into the yogurt that she would make for us. I call my cuisine contemporary American. It is... Upscale. It is adventurous. I don't know what I have to do. Um, it draws on many different influences. For her, American is using what we have here. All the the different ingredients, all the different cultural um, uses of food. So that's how we see American cuisine as as being not hamburgers or hot dogs and apple pie. I have two little blossoms on 12. 
you see her in the press, you see her in the in magazines. But she has no celebrity chef mentality. I mean, it's just I'm just a cook, you know. It's not. I, I certainly I hate the word artist. I hate it when people talk about that, you know, like oh you're an artist. I'm like, no, I'm not. I met Jen at Can Restaurant. Uh, it was my first chef job. There was me and Jen and two other cooks. They were both from Malaysia and they barely spoke English. It was just basically like me and Jen. We had a great time. Did you go deep? How deep did you go? I had a bit of a crush on her, but you know, I'm from the Midwest and gay is not okay. And, um, and, uh, you know, do I look gay? You know, it's sort of like that mentality, like, you know, why would you make your life harder? Several years later, I got married. Anita came to my wedding with her girlfriend. I knew her as the, the straight married girl, you know, <laughs> the, you know, the cute straight married girl. She was probably the first person that I came out to. I think I flipped her out. <laughs> she was definitely shocked. She said, well, I had, I had had a really, I had, I had, had a bad crush on you at Cannes. Um, you know, I, I... And that's probably when you were like... <laughs> yeah, that's and where that's I was like I was falling like... off the couch, yeah. Summer here is like our, our prize. Oh my god. What? I didn't see all the ones. There's on the a million bottom. of yeah. them. No, there's a lot. Okay. There's a ton. I mean we come out every weekend. But we should get them. Do you want any Swiss shark? Any greens? No. Okay. Do you want that stuff? Uh I could, yeah. Or I could use a liquid from your shucking, I don't care. People that really love her food um, love the inventiveness. They love the combinations that you wouldn't normally see, but once you have it on a plate, it makes such sense to you. Do you want me to try and strain this out? Yeah, I think I more than most chefs, she's really heady about coming up with recipes. I'm not as strong as I used to be. I'm not trying to recreate the wheel, you know? We have a reservation for 6.30. It's just food at the end of the day. It's, you know, it's, it's a meal. People are coming out for dinner. Hot. It has to be a passion to do this if you're going to do it well. Out of six. Six. Hi. My sister Anna. <laughs> Hi. I hear you come here often. Okay. <laughs> it's very good. You know, the greeting in Chinese is like, is, is not hello, it's have you eaten yet? You know, it's, it's all about the food. Sometimes radicals appear in the most unlikely places. Defying a Vatican order to silence herself, a gutsy Catholic nun has spoken out against the church's view of homosexuality for over 30 years. Tonight's Real to Real follows this woman's quest in filmmaker Barbara Rick's documentary, in good conscience. Since I was about that high, as they say, knee high to a grasshopper, I thought that God was calling me to religious life. So after high school, I entered the School Sisters of Notre Dame and was a, a good little nun for many, many years until I met a gay man. And that friendship really changed the direction of my life. I just feel that uh, Dominic, who got me into this ministry in 1971, when he said, you know, what's the Catholic Church doing for my gay brothers and sisters? And I said, I don't know. He said, well, sister, you know, do you better do something, you know? I think there's a spirituality there that I can bring that a straight person cannot. But uh, yes, my church has abandoned me. Why should I spend time going to a church that doesn't like me, that doesn't want me for who I am. I've been offended by actions of uh, members of the Roman Catholic Church that I've grown up in. My job is to try to help people like you reclaim your church and to try to help the church institution to welcome back its lesbian and gay members. 
This has been a project that first came to me in 2000. It was the spring of 2000, and I read an article about this nun who was very gently and very radically defying a Vatican order, that she silence herself about her ministry to gay and lesbian Catholics. A nun visiting Rock Island could get expelled from her religious community for speaking her mind, but that's not stopping her. What is the place of silencing in the social teaching of our church? There are many things in scripture that had meaning. She felt she was called to be a bridge between gay and lesbian Catholics and church hierarchy. So let's not censor ourselves from uh, things in the, in the church that we have a right to. So she started New Ways Ministry many years ago, and this was a way to kind of introduce gay and lesbian Catholics to the good parts of Catholicism that kind of embraces them, and also to introduce Catholic hierarchy to the good men and women who are living really spiritual lives, who happen to uh, have a different sexual orientation. If the Eucharist was meant for people who are pure and holy, God, who would go there? I mean, <laughs> who, which one of us is worthy <laughs> to receive Christ? No, none of us. The Vatican became increasingly unhappy with her tone, and they felt she was not emphasizing the sinfulness of homosexuality enough, so they went after her to shut her down. That's the offices for the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. That building has been the home of the bureaucratic department of the Vatican that has silenced a number of people over the centuries. And uh, from that office came the piece of paper, the notification in 1999 that said that I should no longer be in pastoral ministry with lesbian or gay people. She actually pointed out the Office of the Inquisition this is the same office that had ordered the excommunication of all these amazing people who were later embraced as visionaries. This is the same office that had tried to silence Sister Janine. I would be acceptable uh, to the Vatican if I were quiet, if I were silent. But um, that's not right. We should not be treating others as second-class citizens. Lesbian and gay people have a rightful place in the church just like everyone else. When you have the, um, the Vatican representing the church go so far as to say you can't speak, how do you, how do you stay Catholic? How do you keep your faith through that? You, you stay Catholic because we realize that the church is the people of God. The church isn't merely church leaders. She has a great respect and a great love for the church. And that's what I think makes the film most effective, is that it's not a hate document. You have someone like Sister Janine, who has this very radical idea of taking on her enemies completely without rancor. And it's just a, it's a whole new ballgame. I wanted to talk with you about banning homosexual priests. Yes. Do you, do you believe that we should do that? I mean, isn't that kind of unfair? In the seminary, in the seminary. Get the gays out of the seminary. Yeah, they've, they've, they've turned into an underground uh, pollution. But there are good priests who are homosexual. You wouldn't want to root them out. I have to take the risk of looking homophobic. I have been in a ministry, a church ministry, right. to try to um, tell lesbian and gay Catholics that you know they're part of the church too. They have gifts to offer the church. You Do you know, know Sister Grammy? Do you work with Sister Grammy? I am Sister Grammy. You are Sister Grammy. By continuing her work, by continuing her ministry, by continuing to speak out when she has been told to be silent, she does run the risk of stirring up the Vatican's ire. And uh, they wanted her order, the School Sisters of Notre Dame, to silence her. And many times the School Sisters of Notre Dame came to her defense. And in the end, because of a fear of retribution from the Vatican and what might happen to the order if they continued to support Sister, they finally had to, to buckle and ask her to be silent. My response to my superior general in Rome was, in conscience, uh, I choose not to collaborate with my own oppression. And the superior general of the SSNDs, she asked if there were any other options. And I said, well, I could transfer to another community. And I immediately thought of the uh, Loretto's. It's the oldest order of American nuns in the country. And they have long stood for justice. And they said, 
you know, if it helps you, we want you to come and do your ministry with us. And that gave her a reprieve from the orders, silencing from her own order. She left the School Sisters of Notre Dame and came on board with the Sisters of Loretto, who were sort of like the cavalry. They're pioneer women, they're frontier women, and I just feel in my heart so much like a, a Loretto. Well, I decided to do the film because it would give much more exposure to the work that I'm doing for lesbian and gay people. It just resonated very deeply in me, this idea that this woman was being ordered silenced. And uh, I said, you know, this is the subject of my next film. It's about celebrating the courage of this woman who is on your side and working diligently to make life better. I hope that this film will enable people who are not lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgendered to understand uh, oppression. This is a universal story that is much bigger than a Catholic story or a gay and lesbian story. This is about humanity and, and treating people decently and, and standing up for what you believe in. Hi, I'm Jennifer Aniston. No, I'm lying. I'm Carson Cressley from Queer Eye for the Straight Guy, and you're watching In the Life. For more than 40 years, the work of Broadway's Jerry Herman has defined the great American musical. In fact, he's the only composer lyricist in Broadway history to have had three of his musicals, Hello, Dolly, Mame, and La Caja Fall, run for more than 1,500 performances each. In a rare interview, Jerry, who was literally born on Broadway, talks about his incredible life in the theater. I was born in a hospital room where my mother's window overlooked the marquee of the Winter Garden Theater. And of course, she had no idea that 34 years later, her son's musical Mame would be emblazoned on that marquee. It is probably a cliche to have a gay son who thinks his mother is the most glamorous, wonderful thing in the world. But my mother, Ruth, was all of those things. She was a piano player and singer. She had her own radio show before I was born. My parents loved the musical theater. And the night I, they took me to Annie Get Your Gun, they really created a monster. It really was a turning point. From that moment on, I knew that if there was one dream that I had, it was to write songs like Irving Berlin Road and to give the gift of music to other people the way he had given it to me. So Jerry pursued his dream to write music, and through his teens and 20s, he honed his craft, writing songs for review and small off-Broadway shows. With the premiere of his first Broadway musical, Milk and Honey, in 1961, everything started to change. It got wonderful reviews, and I got nominated for a Tony Award. And I was really swept away. Following the success of Milk and Honey, Jerry was asked by Broadway impresario David Merrick and director Gower Champion to work on a new musical based on Thornton Wilder's play, The Matchmaker. It was to be called Hello, Dolly. I had written the score for Ethel Merman. And when it came time to play it for Ethel, she announced that she never wanted to do another Broadway show. I was devastated, of course, because that was my, my idol and my goal was to, you know, to have her in a show of mine. But Gower said, I have an idea. I worked with a woman named Carol Channing in a review called Lendineer, and I think she can be marvelous in this role. Well, it changed my whole life. It was truly love at first sight for both of us. He really was gorgeous. It was love at first sight. And Jerry insists it was mutual. Now you know. I mean, really. Here I had a score that was written for Ethel Merman, and so all of Ethel's, what we call money notes, you know, those high Cs, were way out of Carol's range. And to break the ice, I said, Carol, I've always wanted to hear these songs way down in the register that the men sing in. He said, I want Mother Earth. That's what I want. And he said, that's the way I conceived it, and that's the way I always wanted it. He lied in his teeth. No composer wants his song sung down there. 
and we did it anyway, and I relaxed completely because, and I just said, hello, Harry. Well, hello, Louis. I did do a lot of changing for Carol. And all to the good. We hugged and we laughed and we have ne never stopped laughing. It was a partnership that worked. When Hello, Dolly! opened on Broadway on January 19, 1964, it was a smash hit. It was the hit of the decade. We won not only 10 Tony Awards and Grammy Awards, but Drama Critics Awards. I had no idea that I was about to follow it with another experience that was as, as satisfying or more satisfying, uh, a little thing called Mame. We were searching for a lady to play Mame. And we had, at this point, honestly seen every lady who was breathing in New York City. I had just done a tremendously exciting musical called Anyone Can Whistle, written by Stephen Sondheim, which had run for exactly nine performances and had closed. So I went home to California with my tail between my legs. I remember this stunning lady, who, of course, I knew as a great screen actress, belting out a Sondheim song, and she knocked me out of my seat. And so I picked up the phone and I called our producers uh, uh, and I said I found I found our main the producers were hesitant to even audition Lansbury she was best known for playing matronly roles in films certainly not for being a glamorous leading lady but Jerry insisted and a few days later there at my front door was this tall elegant lady in a mink coat and I took one look at her. It was the first time I'd ever seen her in person. And I, and I, my heart stopped for a minute because I knew that that was Mame. What was afoot was a huge Broadway musical, which Jerry had written. And he, the, the only one at this point, who believed that I could play Mame. I started teaching her It's Today, the opening number, and if he walked into my life. I thought the contrast between those two numbers would show everything that, that, that she needed. It gave me great confidence. Because if he felt I could do it, then I thought, well, um, if he thinks I can do it, I can do it. I made her a tape, and I said, go to bed with this tape in your ear, and I'll meet you tomorrow morning, and we'll, we'll go over it once more. Jerry was absolutely adamant that I, that I impress them with my prowess as a singer and also to act the role. And so he said, look, what I'm going to do is I'm going to play the piano for you. And she walked out on stage with her mink and threw it on a chair in a wonderfully uh, 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 dramatic and, 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 uh, and theatrical gesture. And she heard this arpeggio, and she went, light the candles. Get the eyes out, roll the rug up, it's today. The most exciting thing in the world. And Jerry was overjoyed. I mean, never knew anybody who was more supportive of an actress at that moment than Jerry. It was a lovely thing to see a great actress emerge as a great musical star. She became the, the darling of Broadway musicals, and she won four Tony Awards, two in shows of mine, Mame and Dear World. Jerry's next three shows, Dear World, Mac and Mabel, and The Grand Tour, were not considered successful. The decade of the 70s was difficult, but everything changed one day when Jerry went to the movies. I went to see a film called La Cage aux Folles at a little art theater with my friend Chuck. And I walked out of that theater into the daylight, and I said, this is going to be my next musical. I won another Tony Award, and I had a five-year run, and it was one of the most joyous experiences I've ever, I've ever lived through. 
One song from Lacage, I Am What I Am, has become particularly meaningful to the gay community. I didn't really know how that song affected the gay community until a gay pride parade, a float, came by. And I Am What I Am was blared out of that float. And everybody in the group that I was in stopped and I saw people crying. And it was one of the great moments of my life and I had no idea until that moment how, how important that song was. These days, Jerry remains one of the busiest people in show business, traveling the country, speaking to college students about musical theater, buying and completely redesigning houses like this, his current home in Beverly Hills, spending time with his partner, and writing his next musical called Miss Spectacular. I follow him implicitly. The, he was handed so many different talents. The range of the man is unbelievable. I don't think Jerry has ever uh, been given the credit that he, that he should have over these many years because he's an extraordinarily good lyricist and he's also a great melody spinner. I mean, there's no question about it. When somebody writes me a letter and, and says, when, when my housework gets too, too overwhelming and when the kids are really, I, I turn my, my MAME album on and I sing We Need a Little Christmas with, with, with Miss Lansbury and I get through the day that way. That letter made me cry because that's the stranger that I made sing the way Irving Berlin made me sing that night that I went to see Annie Get Your Gun. Throughout this next season, we will highlight touchstone experiences that collectively bring us together. Almost everyone has at least one coming out story that they will never forget. I had a lot of brothers and sisters, and I had to come out to every single one of them. You know, that's why God invented voicemail. That's the difference in 13 years. Tonight, In the Life is going to feature personal memories of this pivotal moment. I was 19 years old. My mom was sitting in the kitchen, and she said to me, you know, it's so strange. I just recently found out that uh, Jeff down the street is gay. And last year we found out that John so-and-so and his brother Pat were also gay. And she said, I don't know what's going on. I mean, this is on one street in suburban America. You know, is it something going on in the neighborhood or is there something in the water? And I just started to laugh. I just started to crack up and she said, why are you laughing? And I said, Mom, I'm gay too. <laughs> and I just felt so, I mean, it was so unplanned and so spontaneous. And, you know, I, I, I felt terrible doing it that way, but I just couldn't let the opportunity go by just to tell her that, um, you know, hey, you know, it's an epidemic on our street. <laughs> and she just kind of um, dropped her peeler or knife or paring knife and kind of put her face in her hands and she didn't start getting hysterical but she teared up a little bit and um, I went over and hugged her immediately and just said mom it's okay it's okay you know I'm just me I'm just me and then I think we heard my father coming and she quickly said okay you know we're not we're not going to tell your father about this right now it didn't take me long to realize that there was this woman with really blue blue eyes and I just was like wow She's cute. And she asked me to dance, and I did. And we're going back in the car, and I said, so does this mean that you're, you're queer? And uh, Dusty says, well, yes. And I asked the other people in the car, and all of them informed me that, yes, they all were. And uh, when I got back to the barracks, I got my best friend up, Kuhun Nahana, who's from Hawaii. And uh, I, we were very, very close friends. I knew about her sex life because I drove her to a motel with her boyfriend. And uh, I woke her up and we went up to the kitchen because that was one of the safe places to talk 
it wasn't always safe to talk in the barracks. And in the kitchen, you could make enough noise for it to be safe. So we're making noise in the kitchen, and I said to Kahuna, I think I'm gay. And she says, what? I said, I think I'm gay. Well, how do you know? I said, she had blue eyes. That's all I can tell you. My grandmother and I have this relationship where we kind of get snarky with each other sometimes. And so I said something to her that might have been sort of sarcastic or whatever. And she was leaning over the sink. And then I noticed that something was weird. And she was there for a bit. And I could, she just started to cry. And I was like, what's wrong? And she said, Justin, I've just been wondering about your sexuality. And I was just like, what? And I, I didn't know what to do for a moment. I kind of just stared at her. And I was, I was feeling like, first of all, I felt kind of trapped, like, oh, wow, I'm going to have to say something here. And then it, the other thing was just to sort of completely back away from it, which is what I did. And I, I just, I was like, what do you mean? And she said, well, it's just something that I've been wondering about. And I was like, well, I don't understand why you're asking me these questions. And so then I left the kitchen and I remember uh, the next thing that I said to her after that was that the computer was fixed. I had just started to think about being a lesbian. It was just like an inkling in the back of my brain. And uh, I was at the front porch, and we keep our, our actually piano table desk in front of the porch to protect from any outsiders, which is kind of ironic. And uh, Time Magazine was there, and Ellen DeGeneres was on the cover of Time Magazine because she had just come out, out on her show. And I said to my mom, and I don't really believe that I just said it like this, but I was like, Mom, I'm gay. And she looked at the cover of Time, and she said, you've been watching too much of this. <laughs> Regarding my parents, I really regret not telling them that I was gay. Uh, the, the rationalization I used for myself was that uh, they couldn't handle it or they don't want to know. Probably that they don't want to know was, was more correct and, and I think they could have handled it, really. Um, and, then, um, and then my father died. Uh, I was a grown man, of course, by this time, and there was this disappointment of, that he really didn't know me. And, and we had stopped talking about personal issues, about your personal life. I called my dad and I said, Bonnie and I want to move in together and we're buying a house together. And he said, oh, what are you buying a house for, with another girl for? You'll never get married if you do that. And, and Bonnie was across the room saying to me in sort of sign language, tell him, tell him. And she finally looked at me like she was going to walk out if I didn't tell him. And I said, well, Dad, I, I want to buy a house with another woman because he says, oh, it's the wrong thing to do. I said, well, Dad, let me tell you, it's because we want to live together um, for the rest of our lives. Uh, do you understand what I'm talking about? And he said, I think so. I said, well, how do you feel about that? And there was a long pause. And he said, well, it is 1982. And then I heard him say to his wife, my stepmother, Joan, get me a drink. <laughs> I'm Kate Clinton. This place is great. So, you know, from all of us at In the Life, thanks for watching, and we'll see you next month, or I'll come to your house.
Living the Life is funded in part by the H. Van Ameringen Foundation. Additional support provided by the Ford Foundation, the Gill Foundation, and the annual support of In the Life members like you. Thank you.